So hello and thanks for joining us for today's web webinar on understanding SIF and which clients qualify. Uh, before we get to introductions, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. This webinar is pending MCLE credit. In order to qualify for the credit, you'll need to stay logged in for the entire session. Hopefully we'll have enough time to answer many of your questions. If you have questions that you'd like to ask, please click on the Q&A bubble on the bottom of your screen and type them there. My name is John Blake and I'm the Director of Sales here at Gemini Legal. We're continuing to strive to bring valuable content for the applicant attorneys throughout the state. Um, and um, you can find our uh, prior webinars on our Gemini Legal YouTube channel, including some webinars on IMR and UR denials, intake, vouchers, and, and a bunch more. Um, you'll also find attorney interviews and other helpful information on that uh, YouTube channel. So I am thrilled to be joined by my uh, panelists today, and I have two of the most knowledgeable attorneys in SIF. I'm gonna let each one of them introduce themselves, starting with John. So go ahead, John. All right, well, good, uh, good afternoon to everybody. My name is John Bloom. I'm a solo practitioner in Sonoma County. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure I can remember as far back as when I was sworn in, but I, I, I heard a rumor that I've been practicing law for 45 years and I've been very successfully unemployed working for myself and my clients for the last 40 years. Two weeks ago, we celebrated four year, 40 years of very happy, successful unemployment of me not working for other attorneys anymore. Um, and uh, so, uh, I represent solely disabled people. Um, I'm an applicant advocate. I don't introduce myself as an applicant's attorney. Um, I am an advocate for disabled people. Um, not everything I do is limited to work comp, but by and large, you have to be pretty sick to get into my practice. And I want to extend uh, whatever uh, elements of knowledge that I've acquired over time to the bar in general so that my training and experience, which has shown itself to be quite productive for my disabled clients, can trickle into your practices uh, and trickle down to aid and support your disabled clients as well. So I'm assuming that most of the folks that are joining us this afternoon are applicants advocates. Uh, and to share my knowledge um, so that you can uh, advance the rights of your clients is a great honor and a great privilege. And I thank you for including me. Uh, it, it, you know, I want to help the community in every way that I can. And this is a great way to do it. So I'm a California certified specialist. I passed my first specialist exam way back in 1982 and uh, more recently renewed my special specialization. Um, and um, I, 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 I it, early in my career, I did a little bit of defense work. I, I really didn't prefer it. I prefer working for disabled people, hoping to you know, make the world a little brighter place. So that's pretty much what uh, I do. Um, I've tried a lot of cases through the years. I call myself an administrative trial lawyer. I don't work with juries. I work with well-educated judges uh, and arbitrators. So that's kind of my path. Um, Scott, if you wanted to introduce yourself, uh, I think that would be a great thing for you to do next. I sure will. So my name is Scott Silberman. Uh, I'm a partner at Silberman and Lamb. And um, I, while I don't have as many uh, bar years experience as Mr. Bloom, I, I can say that I started in workers' comp at the age of five, putting on <laughs> labels for my dad's books when he was sending out flyers to, to sell books on vocational rehab. I so <laughs> That's great. So I, I, I did start at a very early age of child labor. So um, our, our office, we have um, offices uh, from San Diego through uh, Fresno, uh, a few small offices scattered throughout. Um, we do primarily uh, workers' compensation. I represent uh, applicants. Uh, we do a little bit of uh, overlap, maybe 5% of our cases if we have clients with um, some personal injury uh, issues. Um, it, uh, as far as um, subsequent injuries fund, you know, we're primarily in Southern California. 
and I would say subsequent uh, injury benefit trust fund cases um, haven't been as prevalent here as in the North uh, over the years. But I would say in the last uh, 10 years, we've had a, a pretty decent subsequent injuries fund caseload. Before that, our subsequent injury fund cases mainly consisted of somebody that had an injury and we know they had a prior stiff or something like that and it was an obvious, an obvious case. Um, it, um, uh, I am a uh, certified specialist. I've worked with the uh, specialization, uh, um, the workers' compensation specialization section of the bar back when they had um, uh, the, uh, we were called commissioners, I think at the time, something like that. But um, both in, in grading and writing the specialist exams. And now that they've changed that, uh, that function, I'm still um, as part of the, the uh, grading portion of the specialization exams for the state bar. Uh, so I think Great. that's Thank it for me. Both for being here. I appreciate you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this. And uh, John, if you could, can you share a little bit on the origination and background of SIBTF for the folks that have jumped on here? Okay. Uh, I'm glad to do that. Um, the the subsequent injury benefit trust law of California is identified at Labor Code Section 4751. And uh, I, th I really think it bears mention to go deeply into the words and phrases in the statute itself uh, so that we can, you know, kind of create a consciousness on the part of all practitioners before they launch into filing an application for SIBTF entitlements. Uh, I believe that these laws were first enacted in California in 1946 or 1947. And the purpose underscoring the legislative intent was to encourage employment of uh, veterans of World War II who came back from uh, the Pacific theater and the European theater with significant injuries uh, that, uh, that returned uh, to the United States, uh, and this was part of the United States uh, workforce. So the purpose of the subsequent injury benefit trust fund is to compensate people for their, not only their on the job injury, which for lack of a better term, we will call the subsequent industrial injury. When I'm briefing these concepts, I write SII. So not only do they get compensated for the SII and the underlying workers' compensation claim, but when you file an application against subsequent injuries benefit trust fund, <clears throat> you will be asking the courts to have the pre-existing labor disabling dis uh, 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 impairments wrap around the disability tied to the subsequent industrial injury and uh, kind of bootstrap the two of the, those two elements together at 70% overall disability or higher, and they get paid at the rate of 70% or higher or wherever the global combination of disabilities leads you. So the legislative intent was to encourage reemployment of disabled uh, veterans and other people. It doesn't specifically say veterans. You don't have to be a veteran to qualify for this. And uh, the way that we do it is we uh, wrap around pre-existing uh, impairments and uh, hire experts to determine if the pre-existing conditions were labor disabling. And if they were, we tack those uh, to the subsequent injury uh, uh, disability and look at whether or not we've established the thresholds that Scott's gonna talk about in a little while. Um, and again, the threshold criteria is uh, your, your client has to have 70% overall disability in order to qualify for SIBTF entitlement. In a minute, I'm going to be actually reading to you some of the highlights of the actual statute itself. And I know that this tends to put lawyers to sleep. I apologize in advance for that, but it is just so important. It, it's uh, if you if your if your brains work anything like my uh, my brains. You know, it's almost like every time I read this statute, and I've read it hundreds of times, it's something else pops out in it. And um, I'm very determined to establish case law 
through the courts, through judicial review, to speak to every one of those issues that just seem to pop up at me on, on a case by case basis. So the intent, it, it goes way back to the 40s. Uh, when Labor Code Section 4663 was amended 15 years or 16 years ago with Senate Bill 899, uh, there was a whole new era uh, ushered into California work comp practice on the subject of apportionment. A lot of the apportionment that used to be inherent in the compensable consequence of an industrial injury disappeared because the actual language of 4663 that identifies that an employer is only liable for that portion of the disability caused by the work injury. Uh, that that it was very much subject to a different interpretation and different language prior to SB 899. As the apportionment of the new apportionment, I'll call it, uh, hooked in under 4663, uh, it sort of showed up, uh, we needed to search for another place to compensate our severely disabled clients. And so um, as, as the private sector of work comp uh, underwriting uh, got richer because they laid off a lot of uh, liability under apportionment principles, uh, uh, there was a big and steady and measurable shift into pursuing subsequent injuries benefit trust fund because that is that wraps around the pre-existing labor disabling conditions that went out the door on apportionment. So uh, there's a very big tide of increasing filing of applications apparently in California. And, you know, I and some of my colleagues are, are concerned that you know, not all of these applications being filed by our brothers and sisters uh, in the practice of law have uh, merit. So we want to be, I want to encourage uh, all of the constituents who are working with us today to be really discreet on which cases you actually file with the appeals board. Um, we don't want bogus cases, you know, bearing uh, this state agency called subsequent injuries benefit trust fund. They only have limited resources. Uh, we could talk about that. Uh, we'll talk get about that a little later. Yeah. So uh, at this point, um, unless uh, Scott wanted to throw a comment or two in, I wouldn't mind going right into the meat of Labor Code Section 4751. Scott? Yeah, the, the only comment I would want, definitely reiterate your statement about being selective on what we what we file and not just throwing everything out there and seeing what sticks because that could have long-term repercussions on the laws. And also, like you indicated, the caseload of SIBTF, which we know has been, they've been overworked and bombarded for a long time. And now finally, they've beefed up their uh, um, their claims adjusters, which will hopefully help things out. But I, 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 I do agree on your, your comments for that. Yeah, we just have to be super selective. Um, so remember, we have a dichotomy here in the SIBTF world that we don't face all the time in the work comp case. I generally like to handle the work comp case and then launch uh, and, and finesse the work comp case in a manner that helps me launch into my next claim against subsequent injuries benefit trust fund. By the way, when you file your application for subsequent injuries benefit trust fund entitlement, um, we, we wind up, the courts will coordinate scheduling your underlying work comp case with the separate schedule of the uh, uh, Office of the Director Legal Unit that defends the SIBTF claims. And they don't have many days in court, it seems. So there, there's some tactical uh, advice that I'm sure Scott's going to want to sh share with you later on, on whether or not to file and when to file your application. And that, of course, has to be balanced against uh, the timeframes uh, that require, that specify when you must file an application in order to preserve work comp appeals board jurisdiction to adjudicate your claim against SIBTF. There is no technical statute of limitations, uh, but they, the courts borrow from other areas of law and specify uh, those, those dates. We'll cover that in a little while. First, I'd like to get into the meat of uh, Labor Code Section 4751. Um, so 
I believe some of the syllabus materials that are appended to this program include an actual reprint of the statute. And again, I don't want to put you to sleep. I'll move through it as quickly as I can. Uh, but I, I really think it's worth mentioning. And after I'm done kind of giving a little bit of hot air about reading it to you, please take it back with you to your office and read it, read it, reread it, read it again. Uh, it, it's got a lot to it. It's a very complex statute and, um, and it's worth uh, poring over in my opinion. So it says among other things at Labor Code section 4751, if an employee who is permanently partially disabled receives a subsequent compensable injury resulting in additional permanent partial disability so that the degree of the disability caused by the combination of both disabilities is greater than that which would have resulted from the subsequent injury alone and the combined effect of the last injury and the previous disability or impairment is a permanent disability equal to 70% or more of total, he, meaning the injured worker, shall be paid in addition to the compensation due under this code for permanent partial disability caused by the last injury, compensation for the remainder of the combined permanent disability existing after the last injury provided in this article. Let me stop there. That's actually a lot, but the bottom line of what it's saying is, is up to you as the advocate for your disabled client to recognize pre-existing conditions which might add to the disability tied to the last injury in time, relegating them to a 70% disability or higher. And by pre-existing conditions, there's case law that requires you to eventually show through expert evidence that the pre-existing condition was, get this, labor disabling. I know that sounds kind of trite and goes without saying, say it, say it again in your, it's a mantra for me that pre-existing condition has to be labor disabling. And let me just specify, and I'll open this up to Scott in a second. There are all kinds of conditions that can be labor disabling that you, know, you, you might never otherwise think of. Like for example, a childhood learning disability, a childhood uh, or juvenile scoliosis that predisposes uh, to uh, a more substantial injury after the last injury in time. So you can find pre-existing conditions, diabetes mellitus, juvenile diabetes, uh, heart trouble, none of which has anything to do with the subsequent industrial injury, but all of which are capable of being evaluated by an expert. You can hire any expert you want. You don't have to go through the medical unit in SIBTF work. Um, so if I have a heart trouble that's pre-existing that wasn't part of the subsequent injury, I'm going to go out and I'm going to privately hire a cardiologist. If I have a learning disability that pre-existed this, that now also impairs the ability to return to the open labor market and earn a living so that it's contributing to the global level of disability, I'm going to go out and hire a neuropsychologist to uh, measure the pre-existing uh, learning disability attention deficit syndrome, all kinds of subtleties to the normal work comp practice that are, bad, you know, that are very impacting that maybe even your client doesn't think about, but you need to think about it. Um, Scott, what other kinds of pre-existing conditions have you wrapped around and developed evidence on? Well, you know, uh, some of them are, are obvious and obviously labor disabling, right? When you have the applicant that comes into your, your um, office for the initial intake and they're, they have a congenital um, um, issue where they were born with one arm, that should be something that triggers you right away to think about uh, SIBTF from, from day one. But then you know, the, there's other things that, that maybe, you know, you, you won't see without actually going to the uh, person's medical records or taking a complete history from them. You know, perhaps they have uh, a, a lung issue. Perhaps they have asthma that's been pre-existing and prevented them from doing things throughout their life. But when the person walks into my office, I don't see that they have asthma, you know, unless they're sitting there doing their inhaler during, uh, during our, our, our intake. But, you know, somebody that comes in with an arm is somebody that you, so there's 
two different types that I see, you know, the, the obvious where it's triggered right away. And then also some that you have to determine on your, your intake, whether you do that type of intake at the beginning or towards the end when you're looking at SIBTF. And we're going to go over the thresholds in just a minute, but did you have more you wanted to do on the statute there, John? Well, there's more in the statute about the thresholds, but I, I'm, I, I think Scott ought to address the, the second part of this uh, uh, 4751. It's really interesting law. It's a hotbed of litigation. There's lots and lots of case law that helps you through uh, the typical arguments that we see raised by OD legal trying to defend SIBTF against these otherwise legitimate claims. So Scott, if yeah, I'll go into the threshold. Would, basically. You would like me to read the rest of the statute, or you can read it if you prefer, and then you launch into uh, the opposite and corresponding thresholds. Yeah. So it. Um, so basically, the second half of this uh, um, statute, and I don't, I don't remember exactly where you left off in the the reading of it. Is basically covering the um, the thresholds and opposite extremity um, or opposite corresponding uh, member. Um, uh, do, do you know where you left off in reading the statute or should I just? Okay, let me let me just jump into this yeah. thing. So we were, you know, the statute was talking about uh, the combined total level of disability. And there are preliminary thresholds that each one of you practitioners have to meet in order to access SIBTF entitlements for your clients. Um, and it's normally a a 35% standard disability that I want to talk about after Scott's done, but it goes down to that, that threshold can go down to a 5% standard if you have an opposite and corresponding member, you know, two, I, arms, two legs, two eyes, such like that. So um, I could read it to you. I will read it to you if you, if you yeah. prefer right here. If um if you want, I can just jump into the, the thresholds. I think it'll that. cover the statute just just as good as, as please do. So please do. So so basically, and and it does surprise me a lot of people that that don't regularly practice. And I know looking at the list of people here, there's people very very experienced, you know, in in subsequent injuries fund. And so this may be very basic for them what we're talking about. But you know, the first thing for subsequent injuries fund, and as um, John pointed out earlier. What can often be confusing is what is the subsequent injury? Well, that's really your industrial injury. So it's easier to look at when you're explaining to people is we have to first qualify with the industrial injury. So you have an applicant, they, uh, they had an industrial injury. So first thing we have to qualify is does this industrial injury um, qualify for, for SIBTF? And for that prong, in most cases, we're looking at 35% um, disability before adjustments for age and occupation. And I'll go in a second over what, you know, what, what that means, especially now that we have an FEC factor and other things. Um, the, um, uh, and in some cases it's 5% and the 5% is when we have a, a, a corresponding opposite member. And those body parts are actually listed right here in that 4751 and going back to the statute, uh, for the 5%, it would be a hand, an arm, a foot, a leg, uh, or an eye. Um, it, uh, that's just right out of the, out of the statute. Um, so it, it, um, then once we qualify for the 35%, as John had talked about earlier, kind of the, the golden egg, the way I look at it is we got to hit the 70%, right? We're going to, in order to get benefits, we're going to have to have 70% overall, including both our industrial injury or subsequent injury, right? And any pre-existing, uh, as John pointed out, labor disabling uh, injuries or conditions that it, were in existence prior to the industrial injury. So I always look at it as a timeline, like I'm looking basically for the person's date of birth up until that date of injury right? Your client's always going to tell you about what happened afterwards, right? Well, you know, a year after my injury, I had a car accident. It doesn't matter, right? We're only looking uh, backwards. Now, as far as um, uh, what counts for that 5% or 35%, so before age and occupation, so when is that easy to look? Well, it's easy to look at for 
old system case, right? If you have a, a 30% a, a 30 standard on a no, uh, no heavy work restriction or an old case, then we're looking at that at that 30. Now, under the new cases where we have a, a um, the FEC factor or the 1.4 modifier, yes, you can use that to, um, to qualify for that 5% or 35% for your underlying uh, um, case. So it, um, um, and it does surprise me. It's, and, and, you know, this is geared towards applicant attorneys, but it's also important for defense attorneys to know this because it can help like I'll talk a little bit about later, you know, when, when you're resolving a case and so forth to, to know about the pre-existing conditions and there may be a subsequent injuries fund case coming, coming later. Um, but- uh, do, you, do you ever use your underlying work comp relationship with defense counsel on the work comp uh, defense? Uh, do you ever work with opposing counsel to engineer, shall we say, an off-ramp from the work comp claim that bootstraps you or creates a launching pad into your SIBTF claim? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely uh, do. And um, uh, it can be for two things, right? It, I can use it both for my threshold issues. If, uh, if I have a case where, you know, I'm not meeting the 35%, but I'm trying to bring in an opposite extremity. I'll often explain it to the defense on what I'm trying to do. And they may help me creatively get there so we can get the case resolved. Um, the same thing with if I'm doing a deposition on the, in, uh, you know, the internal medicine AME, and I got a laundry list of things for my SIBTF case, I may address them at the, um, at the deposition of the AME before I've even filed SIBTF. So I, I do appreciate it when I have a defense attorney who understands uh, SIBTF. And if that's my goal in the case, um, then there's a lot of moving parts that, that is important. Can I just mention that uh, oftentimes um, I will, I'll at least file my application against SIBTF in a, in a timely way. <clears throat> to preserve work comp jurisdiction over the SIBTF access and entitlement for a later date. But I typically bifurcate the SIBTF program and claim uh, from the development on my uh, claim against the underlying work comp carrier. So I'll get them both on the same ADJ number, but I'll put off the processing of the SIBTF claim until after I'm done on the work comp claim. Traditionally, I treat, you know, if, if I've got a, a case that can be argued successfully as totally disabling and potentially against the, the sole, you know, the subsequent industrial injury, we'll try to prosecute that to conclusion. And if I do not succeed, I've got the safety net of an existing SIBTF claim to fall back on. Other practitioners uh, who are fantastic colleagues tell me oppositely. They, they like to prosecute both claims at the same time and kind of play two, two claims off against the middle, which professionally I find confusing. Uh, so I, uh, so, but at other times I'll have a claim of total disability going against the work comp carrier on the last claim. Um, and then if I've got my SIBTF fallback safety net positioned, I can work with opposing counsel to engineer an outcome that's short of permanent total, uh, which is what a colleague of mine called an off-ramp for or uh, to get to the settlement on the underlying work comp case. But I can engineer language in that settlement, either by stipulation or by CNR, that is that are buzzwords for winning the SIBTF claim. So I really think that it helps to have the same practitioner handling the work comp case and the subsequent injuries benefit for trust fund case. Yeah, and uh, we've kind of handled it. I would say that 90% of our cases or 95 are handled that way where we handle the SIBTF issue after the, um, uh, the, the industrial injury has, has concluded. But we have had some where, you know, maybe it's gonna be 100% uh, either way 
And so we try it all at once, whether we're going to, we're going to get hundred percent from and that. In those cases, it's kind of nice because SIBTF maybe, uh, or is on our side, trying to prove the industrial injury at hundred percent. Good for us because we won't have some of those credits like SSDI and things that we can get to hundred percent from the uh, industrial carrier. But for most of them, we, we do handle it um, afterwards because the getting the reports and everything is, is, you know, if you can get hundred percent on the industrial case, then you don't have to go through sending them out to your, your SIF doctors and so forth. So Scott, can I ask you, what do you do when subsequent injuries fund representatives at OD legal argue to you, well, uh, when you're trying to pursue an opposite and corresponding threshold that's short of the 35% standard referenced in the statute, if you want to get that 5% access to SIBTF because you have opposite and corresponding arguments, uh, what do you do when your argument is you had a, your client had a pre-existing right shoulder and the work-related subsequent injury is to the left hand? Right shoulder pre-existing, left hand subsequent injury. Right. What do you do when OD legal argues to you, well, you know, that's not a, a, a it's not an opposite hand or an opposite shoulder. How dare you promote the concept of opposite and corresponding when it's a shoulder to a wrist? Does that qualify for 4751 uh, uh, opposite and corresponding in your experience? Well, it's interesting because if we actually read the statute again, it does reference arm and leg, right? And um, so, you know, my, my argument is, is your arm is extending from your shoulder to your, to your fingers. And of course, they will point out that even though arm and leg are listed on there, hand and foot are listed separately, which I think is, is interesting. So maybe someone at some point thought that a hand wasn't part of a, uh, uh, an arm, but um, uh, that's, that's at least our approach. I really don't, can't think of a case where we rested on that particular argument because, but I, I mean, what, what have you seen, John? So I see this argument raised absolutely all the time. And there is case law. I apologize. I should have uh, created it as part of your syllabus. I apologize um, for not including it today. But there is case law that confirms without question the, the requirement that the judges implement the, uh, the legislative intent and the language of the statute. And the language says provided that either the previous disability or impairment get this affected a hand, an arm, a foot, a leg, or an eye. So the key word is affected. And when you have a, a, a hand that you're claiming to be opposite and corresponding to a, a shoulder on the other side of a human body, we know that it's just pretty simple to prove that a, a significant shoulder impairment does affect the arm, which affects the hand, and it's a, it, it's a cakewalk to argue that it affects the opposite extremity. So uh, you can have an ankle on the left and a right knee on the right. It affects the leg. So it affects the opposite and corresponding. So when OD legal argues, oh, you know, a, a right ankle and a left hip are not the same member you know, just blow them away. That's, that's an argument we see all the time. It has no merit. Uh, don't let them buffalo you and don't let them throw five cents on the dollar scare, scaring you away. Uh, and don't let the judge scare you away either. Uh, you know, if you, if you have a, a read on this statute and this entitlement, be tenacious. Uh, it, it helps, it works. And the amount of money that you are going to achieve for your clients is astonishing. It's TD for life if you're going to prove total disability. And that TD for life is COLA enhanced. And that TD for life is also retroactive to the last date that temporary disability was paid uh, in the underlying pre-existing, uh, excuse me, it's retroactive to the last day temporary disability was paid in the subsequent industrial injury.
Right. So uh, th that that's key. I mean, some of these retroactive entitlements on the differential between permanent partial disability in the work comp case and permanent total disability on the subsequent industrial, excuse me, the subsequent injuries benefit trust fund case, it, it's phenomenal. It goes into the hundreds of thousands of dollars often on the retroactive pay, and then they get TD for life. It keeps a roof over their head, food on their table, uh, sort of like very few other work comp uh, as, uh, accesses will achieve. So yeah, I just wanted to get that in there on the word. Of and then just, just to bounce off your affected extremity, um, we, we have used like uh, radiculopathy going into, you know, from a neck injury going into an arm to be, the, to be using that same effective analogy, but. Absolutely. Great. I, so I probably are, should move uh, on here. To, yeah, we're call. about, we're, we're time flying on us and we have a few questions that I wanted to get okay. to if I could. Uh, we have to one question. Can you file an SIF case before the work comp case is settled and then use the SIF reports to prove denied injuries, neuropsych injuries or others with the QMA, QME attained under the SIF case? Well, that's a really good question because it goes to admissibility uh, outside of the QME process. Uh, um, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. Uh, Scott, if you have a, a direct- Yeah, no, I mean, it's an issue we've tossed hard around before. It's an idea we've definitely uh, tossed around. Um, I think if it's something you're gonna try both together, then judge is gonna have to, to, to look at it. I mean, I, I don't know of any cases that have actually tried and, and um, used that. I mean, you, you have reports that were- permissibly attained, even if it's in the SIF portion of the case, I mean, they both carry the same board number. Um, I, I, but I, I think the defense is going to have a relatively strong argument, especially if it's AOE, COE that you're, that you're going after. That's an interesting case. I, I, honestly, that's at least a one hour program. It is totally worth drilling down to get to uh, the answer on strategy uh, of developing evidence. Because remember in work comp, on the work comp case, We've got to go through the traditional mechanics of invoking a QME. But on the SIBTF claim, it's just like the old days. You just push a button and hire any doc you want. Doesn't even have to be a QME. Um, I, I tend to retain QMEs because I think the board likes uh, that pedigree of acknowledgement from the medical unit that makes them uh, experts in our system of work comp. Uh, but, you know, the, the SIBTF people have to pay the costs of your QMEs on the SIBTF case. You're allowed to have private conversations with your QMEs on the SIBTF case. Uh, whereas, you know, under, you know, the 3100 or the 31, rule 31 at SEC, uh, the regulations are very damning for, you know, uh, the remedies of law. If you have a private conversation with a workers' compensation QME, you're not allowed to ex parte communications. We all know that, but on the SIBTF track, you pick up the phone and you talk to the experts and you tell them what your theory is. Uh, and they can call for clarification as well. By the way, I just wanna to mention to you, I know this is not scheduled on the, 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 the uh, outline, but um, I just, I wanna emphasize to all of you practitioners, uh, the elements of proving a subsequent injury benefit trust fund case are distinctly different from the elements that we prove in the underlying work comp case. And so we are not required to go back to the work comp QME when later prosecuting the SIBTF case because the underlying work comp QME didn't address the distinct elements of SIBTF thresholds that Scott has been talking about. Uh, and um, so sometimes we get the argument, oh, you can't just go out and shop for any lawyer, uh, any do uh, doctor you want. You have to use the old work comp QME. You know, some of these work comp QMEs have no idea what SIBTF law is or how to analyze those issues. So please educate your judges to remember that it's an important uh, concept of access to evidence. So I've got another question here, and then we'll see if we can move on a little bit. Uh, can the 35% after DFEC be before apportionment under bookout? Example, 42% after DFEC apportion, 50% to SII. 
question mark. You want to handle that, Scott? Yeah, and actually, it, but that's exactly what Bookout is, right? That the the qualifying is before uh, before age occupation and before abortion. I mean, if I put it in a quick quick nutshell, and, and I'll go over some of the facts to the Richard Todd case, and actually, in Richard Todd. They do a complete analysis of uh, uh, why don't we do and that now? It. In the interest okay. of time, let's see if we can yeah. get into that quickly. Okay, so I'll I'll kind of quickly recap the facts, and a lot of you probably know the the, the facts, especially if you've read the case or if you've read a, a summary. But the applicant was a police officer that had an industrial uh, CT injury and resulted in an award of sixty four percent disability. The case was later reopened and it resulted in an award of sixty eight percent disability, and that was for hypertension, kidneys, and psych. Now, the real issue in this case was um, whether it, it's going to be uh, the, the disability should be added or it should be combined. Um, and they talked about both the MDT and the combined disabilities uh, table. The, um, the applicant had filed the SIBTF case. And prior to the last injury, the applicant actually had five stipulated cases um, that, uh, but um, the the applicant's attorney and the applicant only actually relied on three of those stipulated injuries for the um, for the award. Um, one for the back for 23%, one for the right shoulder for 10%, and one gastrointestinal for 8%. The, the, the holding was that the uh, board found that since there's no overlapping body parts, that the disabilities should all be, be added. Okay, so What's significant for this? Well, obviously adding versus combining is very significant, right? Um, this had been an, an ongoing uh, argument for years. Um, the, also, um, the, uh, as far as why they use the three, my guess is there might've been some overlapping body parts. <laughs> they didn't wanna use the other two and they already came out to a hundred with just these three. Another thing that I felt was very important just from the holding in this is that here we had ratings from both old and new system. And they did add them all um, up, whether it was old and new. I mean, I know I've had arguments before that we needed to re-rate something under the, uh, the new system by, by OD Legal. So that was, um, and that was actually in the holding. Um, so if you've just read a summary of, um, of this case, you probably knew these facts in the holding. But to tell you the truth, if you haven't read it, you haven't done much SIF, this, this uh, decision, this in-bank decision, basically provides a primer on many SIBTF issues that tells even more than we can really cover in this seminar. It goes over what SIBTF is, it goes over statute of limitations issues, it goes over what must be established in an SIBTF case, it goes over book out that we talked about uh, just now, um, it, it, um, is that, and that also talked about um, adding, it also talked about uh, um, the, uh, the qualifying, disability being before apportionment. Um, and, um, and also lastly discussed that SIBTF owes the monetary difference between the two percentages, less credit and offsets, even though I believe they, they said that SIF admitted that Bookout screwed up on that part of it. But um, um, so that that's basically Richard Todd, but my big thing is if you haven't actually read the case, and especially if you don't practice too much SIBTF, read this case. There's a lot of information in there um, that um, is and it's a very easy reading. I totally agree. We've attached the uh, full uh, opinion of the en banc uh, commissioners. Uh, it is totally worth reading and rereading. Uh, I, I, I agree with Scott. It's a primer in many issues in work comp. I have recently used the, the, the concepts under Todd which says that you can add pre-existing to your, uh, you can add prior awards, just add them straight on to the disability tied to the subsequent industrial injury to come up with 70% or higher. I recently worked on a, a case in which when you add the first two disabilities, it exceeded 100%. And then you get to the subsequent industrial injury, which is even higher. And you, you know, the statute specifically says the combination of pre-existing in conjunction with uh, the subsequent industrial injury must show that the subsequent industrial injury made them worse, right? So if they were already totally disabled before the subsequent industrial injury, you don't qualify for subsequent injury benefit trust fund entitlements. 
but you can always work and weave those facts if you can show that the pre-existing uh, percentages of disability didn't actually stop that person from working and earning a living in the open labor market, then uh, even something that might be considered essentially presumptively correct, like pre-existing findings and awards and percentages that identified to that, uh, they fall by the wayside. So you can either add them at your discretion or you can combine them and show that they weren't in fact totally disabled before the subsequent industrial injury, the last injury in time. Um, should and we have a couple of remarks about timing to file these things? Under that's that? where I was gonna go next. So, um, and I know we did include in the uh, handouts, the Talcott case. So do you wanna talk about statute of limitations or, or, or you know, as close as we can to, since there is none, but go ahead. Okay, well, you know, Scott, I don't mean to dominate this conversation. No, no, go, go right ahead. No, okay, you. thank you. Um, you know, I, I do think that uh, the leading case in California defining statute of limitations in the subsequent industrial, uh, subsequent injury uh, fund uh, arena came down from the California Supreme Court uh, back in, um, I think it was 1970 or 1974, something like that. Um, please read the Talcott decision. It's very critical. I came up against a, a statute of limitations, pardon the phrase, argument uh, uh, several years ago and had to take the darn thing up to the California Court of Appeal on the edge of my seat, you know, kind of a million dollars hanging in the balance of not having filed in accordance with Talcott. Um, and, um, you know, it's scary to not know what the law says. And since there is no statute of limitations, uh, you know, traditionally throughout all time, I would simply say, well, I'm just going to wait until the end of my work comp case, and then we'll decide whether or not to pursue uh, an SIBTF claim. Why waste everybody's time and money filing an application before we know? Um, and then, of course, once I wrapped up the work comp case for less than 100% and then pursued the SIBTF claim, they raised statute of limitations. So I, I had to kind of grind down on the cases. And there is no statute that defines when to file, which, you know, guys, insecure people like me like to see the, the, the black and white law. You know, that way I can know what I'm doing. But, you know, if there's no statute, then, you know, hey, I'm just going to use my judgment and file after I know if there's really a legitimate claim. The defense argued in that case that there's a five-year time frame within which to file, five years from the date of injury. Uh, and if you don't file, you're out. They also did to me on that case what they did to Scott on the case he was talking about. You should have known. You should have known that this person had pre-existing disability. You should have known, and you should have filed sooner. On the case that you know I had to deal with, it was a filing that was like seven years after the date of, it, of the last injury in time. Um, so we argued it. The judge disagreed with the SIBTF argument that uh, it was not timely filed within five years from, this, from the, the date of loss. Um, and so he, he knocked down the defense of requiring it to be filed within five years because the Supreme Court in Talcott said, you don't, you don't need to file in five years if there are things that are gonna be changing like your work comp case. But he actually indulged the statute of limitations defense when he pointed out that the application my office filed was six months and three days after the, the uh, order approving the CNR. So he said that was an unreasonable delay and for that reason did not grant SIBTF coverage, having nothing to do with the SIBTF five-year argument, which is bizarre. I filed it, the commissioners agreed with my position and reversed the judge's decision I think it, it went back to the appeals board for because I think SIBTF was first aggrieved and as such they have a right to a second petition for recon. Uh, the board reinstated the first outcome, which is to deny the, the statute defense, um, and it went up to the court of appeal on a writ denied. So it, it changed my practice forever. These days I file within five years, 
but you're not dead in the water if you don't file within five years. Um, and uh, there is a, a case called Jessica Adams, that would be my case, uh, squirted a lot of blood out of my eyeballs to get that case finished successfully. I'm very relieved that it was successful for Jessica. Uh, she received a gigantic retroactive check. Uh, I think it was like sort of almost like seven years gigantic. So um, yeah, that's statute of, limitations, statute of limitations in the nutshell. There is no statute of limitations, but check out the Talcott decision. By the way, the court consolidated four cases with statute of limitations issues on SIBTF at the same time. So when you go to the, the CCCs or whatever resource books you go to, you'll find four Supreme Court cases, all analyzing slightly separate fact patterns on statute of limitations. We should get to the uh, uh, credit and offset discussion briefly before we close. Yeah, and also it should be within a reasonable time, right? I mean, I, I think that that is, people are saying there's no statute. I've heard rumors of people filing SIF on cases that they settled by CNR 20 years ago. And I, I don't think those are gonna be found as a reasonable time. So people that say that there's just no statute, you can file whenever you want. It's not, you can file whenever you want. It's a, it's a reasonable time. Correct, uh, thank you. What about 4753? Yes, let's hit that up. Uh, we got about five minutes left. So you wanna take it, Scott? So, it, um, Sure. Um, so basically, when we get your, your SIF uh, award, you know, it's all uh, fine and dandy, right? And then the question is, well, how much is your client really going to get, right? So um, 4753 uh, is the uh, code that addresses um, credits. Um, if I'm not... Uh, yes, you're correct. <laughs> mistaken. So, so basically for credits, there's many different benefits that they can get credits for. You get, um, there's, there's credits and offsets. And right now I'm gonna lump them all together because we just have a few minutes and there's a little bit, uh, but as far as if the person's getting um, social security disability, uh, there's gonna be um, some credit or offset. Again, I'm gonna lump it together for that. If there's prior awards that you're relying on to get your 100%, they're gonna get you know money or credit for that. Obviously Correct. the the underlying industrial case, they're just paying the difference between the two. So you can see that also is a, is a credit or offset. The one thing to remember that they don't get a credit or offset for is a VA benefits. Um, so you can have a, a VA award that um, they're not going to get a, a credit for. But I think whether it's a PI case or a, a, I think pretty much anything else, social security disability, a disability pension, um, uh, prior awards, prior settlements are all things that they're gonna get um, uh, uh, credit or offset for. One thing your client, if your client's deciding between a disability pension and a regular retirement pension, you know, it's a case where they're really gonna wanna weigh a decision to make in that case, because it could make a big difference in their um, SIBTF. Benefit. So SIBTF does not get a credit for a pension. They do get a credit for a disability pension, right? Right. Like a regular retirement, they're not going to get uh, credit for, you know, kind of like social security disability and regular social security benefits, right? Regular social security benefits, they don't get a credit. They do get a credit for their social security. It's an important distinction. Do they, does SIBTF get a full credit for all the money they get from social security or a pro rata credit? Yeah, it's going to be pro rata. So for example, if you have an underlying award in your, in your underlying case for 89% disability, and then you have an SIBTF award for 100%, they're only going to get 11% of, of the amount of the social security disability as, a, as an offset credit. Yeah, it's a huge deal. So, so have, they're spelled out in Labor Code Section 4751, interestingly, and the credits are spelled out in Labor Code Section 4753. And I believe both statutes were uh, reprinted in your syllabus materials, right? Yes, and I have, I have a couple more things to send out afterwards. And I know that you included something that you sent over to me uh, with a demand letter, a copy of a demand letter. Um, so once you do get everything all worked out, you, you, you get them to your doctors and uh, you've got your case worked up, what do you do? I, I'm sorry, I missed the question. I, I didn't quite track you. 
So getting to you, you at the end of final evaluation, what what do you do after you've got your your uh, final evaluation done? I send over demand to uh, uh, SIBTF and their OD legal uh, representatives. Um, uh, it, I, I give them a brief period of time to analyze the issues. I usually give them uh, 20 to 30 days to think it over. And then I, full, I file a, a declaration of readiness to proceed to hearing. These days, I tend to get more cooperation from OD legal uh, than previously. I'm not sure exactly why, but I'm not uh, gonna stare a gift horse in the mouth. I'd rather settle the case properly than to uh, have to adjudicate the process through the bench. Um, and on the subject, can I just throw out one quick caution? Please be so careful not to just take any lump sum CNR amount of cash that OD Legal throws out to you in lieu of really analyzing and pursuing the SIBTF claim. Uh, they, the, the tradition is monstrously undervaluing uh, the entitlements when you win because the entitlements when you win going into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, often into the millions of dollars. And I'm not exaggerating. I have a 30 year old client who uh, qualifies for total disability. The amount of money that goes his way, uh, having one total is astonishing. So don't, don't take 50,000 or $75,000 on a million dollar claim. And if you're not clear about the values and have to evaluate it, call Scott Silverman. Call, call a practitioner that you have confidence in that knows how to evaluate it because we'll pull out the calculator and crunch the numbers for you and then you take it from there. Yeah, and one thing I would tell people because I've run into a lot of uh, applicant attorneys who indicate that they, they don't do SIBTF for a number of reasons. And, and I understand if you have a, a small firm, you know, SIBTF, I know one of the objections that applicants attorneys never like is we get checks every two weeks on these steps, right? There's no commutation of fees. And some of the cases may have credits and offsets where it's going to be four years before you start getting any benefits. And then you're getting a 15% fee off of your client's you know, $400 check every two weeks if it's a low wage earner. So it is very important that if you don't handle SIBTF or you plan to refer it out or you plan that you have both in your upfront retainer agreement, you let your client know you don't handle SIBTF cases just like you probably let them know you don't handle civil cases, you're not handling their divorce, you're not handling you know, so forth, that will help cover you. And then well, some of the attorneys that we work with that refer us cases, they have another form that they have their clients sign at the end of a case saying that they don't handle it and list us or two or three attorneys who do handle SIBTF cases, especially if there's an issue there. I mean, I can tell you that I have heard, um, well, I've had cases referred to me from malpractice attorneys just to try to to see if we can win the underlying case or not, um, to get over the statute to see before they go after the um, the attorney that handled it to begin with. And luckily so far, I've actually gotten benefits in those cases, but I've also heard stories from um, applicant attorneys who got referral fees for people not filing SIF were much, that were much more than the, the fees they would have gotten on the SIF case to begin with. So it is very important to, to let your client know if you're not handling um, SIBTF cases and to, to you know, either refer them out, but at least let, let them know. From on that note, um, on the information that I send out afterwards as a follow-up to this, there will be a copy of the recording to this, as well as uh, contact information for both John and Scott. So if you'd like to reach out to them, you can do so. Um, I'll try to put in the copy of the demand letter and the Talcott case because somebody said they couldn't find it in what I sent out. So I'll send that out as well. And um, thank you guys both for, for joining and being on the panel. I really appreciate the time. The time goes so quick. I know there's a lot more that we could have gone into. We just don't have time for it. Uh, but thank you uh, to the audience for joining us and to both of the panelists for, for uh, giving, in, giving your time to this. So thank you. And, and thank you. feel free to, to email any, any questions to myself and I'm sure John, John too. And if, uh, if you do need examples of um, referral letters because your office doesn't handle SIBTF cases or the language to put in your initial retainer, I think I've got examples of both of those that I, I can email up to anybody that would like.
like that for their office. Yeah, I'll try to um, uh, I'll try to forward you uh, the the case law that supports the concept of affecting an opposite corresponding because mm -hmm. you know that uh, that's critical language and it's clearly the uh, state of the law in California. All it has to do is affect. It. Wonderful. Anything you got? Anything you two get me? I'll I'll include. Uh, it'll take me a few days to get the recording all cleaned up, and then I'll get it out to everybody with the with your referral information. So again, thank, thank you, you very much to everybody for joining us. Thank you to the panelists, and uh, look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thanks. Great. Okay. Have a great day, Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye. -bye.